Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast, 10 Steps to Better Security Incident Detection with Brian Honan, Leading Security Information Consultant and I'm Meherine Moore with Tripwire, your moderator and host. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping questions. Um, if you would like to ask any questions during the webcast, please do so by clicking on the questions tab at the top of your screen. All questions are directed to the presenters and cannot be viewed by the live audience. They will be collated and answered at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to leave any feedback at the end of the presentation, then please do so by clicking on the ratings tab. I'd now like to introduce your presenter, Brian Honan. Brian is recognized internationally as an expert in the field of information security and has worked with numerous companies in the private sector and with government departments in Ireland, Europe and throughout the United Kingdom. He has also provided advice to the European Commission on matters relating to information security and is on the advisory board for a number of innovative information security companies. I'd like to welcome Brian and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, and welcome along, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your busy days to uh, uh, attend the webcast. So we're going to talk today is about the 10 steps to better security instant detection. I suppose the reason we have to think about these things is because just like everybody else in the world, there are two certainties in life, debt and taxes. But for those of us who are involved in information security, at some stage in our career or wherever we're based, we're going to suffer a security breach. So being prepared for a security incident is important. Uh, but I think equally as important, if not more so, is having early indications uh, that we've got a security breach because the sooner we know about a breach, the sooner we can react. The sooner we can react, the sooner we can contain the breach and reduce the impact and damage that it may cause to our organization. So, you know, all our systems were under constant threat. We have the traditional threats of spyware, phishing, hackers, uh, spam coming in, uh, viruses, trojans. You know, we're constantly bombard being bombarded by, by various different uh, external attacks and internal threats as well. We have uh, uh, careless users who may lose USB sticks, leave laptops lying around. Uh, we may have IT teams who... Uh, make configuration changes to systems, leaving a security hole open, and we end up with a, a security breach. Application security may not be dealt with properly in the applications we're deploying, uh, resulting in a security breach through SQL injection, through web application. So we, as security professionals, we, we have to constantly keep uh, an eye on what's going. And the threats are evolving. Uh, they have changed over quite a number of years. And I've seen that both in my own uh, business uh, uh, working consulting side, but uh, I also run and head Ireland's computer emergency response team, and, and we have seen the number of threats against organizations increase and the types of attacks change over, over time as well. So I suppose historically speaking, back in the uh, mid-'80s when most computing was still mainframe-based uh, or, or even on, on uh, mid-range computing-based, the threats once there weren't a whole lot of threats there, the, there was uh, attacks or, or, or maybe attacks are too strong, or but a lot of research or experimentation being done out of curiosity, really, to see how these computer systems worked and where were the weaknesses in those systems. Not necessarily maybe to to exploit them for any financial gain, but more so to see what well, this is a problem with the computer. Let's see how we can fix it, and that kind of worked through the 80s until the late 80s uh, where people started going, well, maybe we can get become famous about this. Maybe we know a bit, I can become a bit more uh, uh, well-known because I've hacked into some, such a website or a particular area. And uh, that was pretty stable for the early 90s. Then as the Internet grew, we saw more hackers coming out, people still with personal fame, um, looking for personal fame. But well, maybe piece of you know criminal uh, elements getting involved, uh, and in the beginning, in the late nineties, that was very much individuals or a group of individuals just seeing opportunities and hacking into websites, trying to uh, get money out of it. But we see that change now on in in since 
the turn of the century and uh, particularly in the last two or three years is that crime gangs are getting a lot more heavily involved in, in, in organized crime. So the attacks have become more sophisticated, they've become more targeted. Uh, we still have to worry about the the, the other threats such as the, the, the curious uh, hackers, the, the script kiddies. Uh, but criminal elements are getting heavily involved and we also have uh, threats facing us now from international uh, spies be that at the corporate level or the government level as well. So the threats we're facing are increasing all the time as well. So we have the traditional threats we talked about earlier on, but we also have many new other threats come along. And in the last 12 to 18 months, we indeed we've seen the, the rise in the resurgence of hacktivism, where we, we have groups like Anonymous, uh, Lodzak, etc., have you know lashed out or, or targeted companies for various different reasons. Uh, to expose maybe bad security in them or to uh, support their, their cause in some way, shape or form. And that has resulted in bad press or bad issues uh, for, for, for the effective uh, uh, organizations. Our traditional security model as well has also focused on the perimeter. We, we've, we're very good at maybe perimeter security. We put in uh, firewalls, we put in intrusion detection systems, we, we protect our perimeter quite well. We put locks on our doors and our windows, security guards at our data centers. So our perimeter uh, may be quite strong, but how we do business is changing and how our organizations do business is changing. Uh, we now have cloud computing, we now have uh, people using mobile devices. We're trying to put up uh, extranets and intranets with, with different uh, partners and different companies uh, and, and customers. So we're, we're making our data available to more and more entities. And the perimeter is slowly crumbling away. And our, our focus on that has to change as well. Interesting, if uh, we look at the any, any analysis of breach detections and, and security breaches, and in particular, if we use the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report from uh, 2012, they highlight a number of interesting, if not worrying, trends that we should be uh, uh, aware of. Firstly, one of the things they, they show is that 92% of incidents uh, that organizations suffered we actually weren't detected by those organizations, but were detected by third parties, be that customers, uh, be that they were informed by partner companies, a hosting provider, uh, or a supplier, uh, or indeed uh, being informed by law enforcement that they've actually suffered a security breach. Uh, so that's quite a large, of companies, a large number of companies that, that are not aware they've had a security breach. The time to discover security breaches as well is quite worrying in that 85% of those incidents, it took more than a week for the incident to become uh, known about to the organization. So think about it. There's at least a week there for 85% of those companies where the attackers had free reign with, inside the systems to maybe establish a larger beachhead to break into other systems, to, to compromise more systems uh, and uh, steal more data or cause more, more damage. So there, there's quite an, that's quite a large number and a worrying statistic as well is that it takes on average over a week for, for uh, organizations to detect they've got a security incident. Equally worrying is that 97% of those breaches could have been avoided using simple controls. So the media headlines we see about uh, advanced persistent threats or cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, or all these uh, hyped up events, they probably aren't what we should be having our focus on. Our focus should be more on the simple things, on the basics, and using those simple controls, 97% of all incidents reported into the Verizon uh, database investigations report could have been avoided. And the difficulty used to, 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 to exploit those uh, weaknesses was really as not difficult. So the problem we have to think about here is what are, what's going wrong? Why are we so bad at incident detection? And some of the examples we have here, uh, and quite famous ones, 
and indeed these are just to name maybe a few of the more well-known ones, but these incidents uh, highlight again how not detecting an incident early on and reacting to it quickly can lead to bad PR damage or other damages to, to organizations. So DigiNoter, for example, they were a uh, certificate authority based out of Holland, and they got breached by an attacker who gained access to their uh, certificate service and was able to issue certificates under any organization name the, the attacker wanted. So uh, he, he created certificates for Skype, for Gmail, for Microsoft, and lots of other organizations, uh, potentially to use that in the, man in the middle attacks against various different uh, different people. Indeed, the, the, the majority of of people who were uh, compromised using those certificates were based in Iran. Uh, now, the impact that, that security breach went down for months. Uh, did you know that we're not aware the had been breached for nearly two months? As a result of that breach uh, and subsequent bad PR and the uh, various different browser manufacturers not trusting DigiNoter certificates anymore. DigiNoter are now out of business. TK Maxx three years ago announced they had a major security breach, and again, the uh, attackers uh, 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 were in those networks for quite a number of months before they were detected. Sony suffered numerous attacks last year uh, and the previous year uh, as a result of an anonymous uh, setting their, their sights on them. And those, again, those breaches, uh, and in, case, in, in many cases the, 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 the larger breaches, went undetected for quite a while. RSA suffered a breach this time last year where uh, attackers were able to uh, infiltrate RSA's network uh, by using a, a phishing email with a, a, an Excel attachment, which when opened, exploited a flash vulnerability. Uh, but again, it went a few weeks before being detected and before RSA were able to, able to uh, uh, respond. And then finally, the uh, final example there is uh, VeriSign, again, another certificate authority now owned by Symantec. And Symantec, in its annual SEC report, which is the report the Symantec have to give to the uh, U.S. Uh, Stock Exchange Commission uh, to highlight any major issues or risks to the business, one item they put in the report was that uh, their VeriSign subsidiary had suffered a security breach for a number of months before they were aware of it. Now, they said it, it, the breach didn't affect their certificate authority systems and was at a, a non crucial system. But again, uh, another example of an incident not being detected for quite a, a number of, uh, of, of weeks. So why are we so bad in detecting incidents? You know, what is wrong? Are we using uh, the wrong tools? Are they not fit for purpose? Uh, are we not working properly? Are, can we not analyze the information properly. So there's a lot of questions I think we have to look at ourselves and sort of say, well, why is it that we're so bad at detecting these incidents, and what can we do to, 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 to fix it? One of the problems I think we have is the sheer volume of information that we face. Uh, if you look at, at any system that you deploy now, there are log files available uh, in every system, be your firewalls, your servers, your routers, uh, switches, uh, PCs, application level, audit logs, uh, your IDS systems, uh, all these systems are, are spewing out data in huge amounts of volume. Uh, and that can be a problem because it results in our security analysts maybe drowning in too much data. Uh, there's just so much information that we just cannot get a grasp on it properly. And I think that this leads to what I would like to call the Rumsfeld uh, effect, uh, if, if we remember the uh, infamous uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Vice President Rumsfeld, where he talked about how uh, there were known unknowns, and we know what the unknowns are, but we don't know what the unknowns are. Uh, you know, if, if, if you look at it that way, we have so much data at our fingertips, but maybe do we have too much? Are we looking in the wrong areas? Do we not know what we're supposed to be looking for or, or what is the problem? So we end up with this huge confusion and, and amount of information and we just can't cope with it, which can result in you being responsible for information security being the one that is in the line of fire. So 
the hackers get through, uh, compromise the systems, and because we haven't been able to deal with the issue I detected earlier on, the blame is shifted to us as opposed to where the real issue is. So what we want to try and do is try and figure out what ways can we address this problem. So how do we make things better? How do we make things more secure? How do we improve our incident response? How do we reduce that uh, one week detection right down to hopefully days if not hours? How do we ensure that we're the ones who are aware of what our security incidents are and not third parties? And the following 10 steps are uh, ways that I think we can, we can exploit to better enhance our, our incident detection uh, response and capabilities. So, as I said, first thing we need to do is detect the incidents as early as possible. The earlier we detect them, the better we can respond, the, and, 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 and the, the, the impact can be, be minimized as, as much as possible as well. So the first thing I would suggest is we need to understand our business. And when I say our business, I, you know, even if you're working in a government department or in, in a university or educational establishment, when I say business is what I mean is what does your organization do? What does it do to survive? What is its bread and butter? Uh, how is the business organized? Where are the ebbs and flows in business activity? So, you know, for certain businesses there may be huge amounts of activity around the end of quarter each year as sales uh, records have to be, be put in place. Or there may be product launches or uh, and press announcements that are going to happen. How often do these happen? Uh, and how aware are you of how that goes on? You know, are you aware of when your organization is going to make a, a major press announcement? Is it going to sponsor something? Is it going to uh, announce a new product? Is it going to change the way it does business? Uh, you know, and these things can be triggers that could maybe uh, make you a target for somebody to attack you. Uh, you know, again, taking the hacktivist uh, viewpoint, your organization releases a, a press release, they don't like the content, and organize a, a pro, an online protest against your organization as a result. If you're not prepared for that, well, then your instant response is not going to be uh, 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 as, as, as well prepared as it should be. But also, how does your organization work on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, what are the patterns that people in the, in, in the business work to? Do you have a whole lot of remote users? Do you have branch offices? Are there ebbs and flows in when people are more active and, and not active? So, you know, for example, have you got people in your accounts department that work remotely? Well, if you don't and you, you see people log, you know, user IDs for people in the accounts department logging in remotely on a Sunday morning, well, then that should trigger a, a, an alert. Uh, you know, it could be legitimate business use, but at least if you're aware of it, you can investigate and figure out what needs to be taken. So the first step I would suggest is understand your business and appreciate what your business is doing. And that doesn't necessarily need to be too much hard work there. What way to do that, I would suggest, would be to contact your peers. So go to the head of departments in each area, in your sales department or your HR department, in the accounts department, uh, PR, uh, admin, and just talk to your peers, bring them out for lunch, ask them what are their, their concerns, what are, what are their business drivers, therefore you have a better understanding of that and, and, and uh, you, 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 you can appreciate it better. And also there's, there's looking at the uh, uh, annual report for your organization. Have you read it lately? Do you know what, what the business goals are for the organization and what are plans in the next 6, 12, uh, 18 months, etc.? So once you understand your business and how it works, well then analyze your network patterns and see how does that support the business. So, you know, if people are working nine to five and predominantly nine to five from one location, well then your network patterns should reflect that. You should, your, your, your network patterns should reflect where does the uh, ebb and flow of the, of the organization happen. It should be, your ebb and flow of the network traffic should be in line with, with, with the business flow. And anything outside that normal behavior can indicate there is a potential problem. So what tools do people use to do their business? You know, a lot of people on the road are working remotely. 
will, may have tools installed on the computer such as Skype or uh, instant messaging, uh, et cetera. So is that traffic normal on your network? And if it is, well, then there may be legitimate reason for it. But if it's not, then that, that again, that is something to be to be examined. How does your, uh, you know, does your organization have to transfer files or send information to various different locations around the world? If you suddenly detect network traffic, FTPing or doing a file transfer or peer-to-peer -peer traffic to IP addresses outside your organization in regions you may not be doing business with, well, then that should trigger an alert, an alarm, and you should figure, well, hang on, what's happening here? Why are we FTPing files to that site in uh, Eastern Europe or in, in, in Asia? Is there a legitimate reason behind it? And if not, well, then let's investigate and see, uh, do we have a potential breach here? I'll also look at, once you've identified your network patterns and, and you know, even very closely together with this one is segment your information. Try and identify where the information is held on your network. Where are your core assets? Do you know what it is you're supposed to be protecting? So are all your database servers located in one place? Or are they stretched across the organization in different locations, different data centers, uh, or different floors in, 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 in the building? Where are these servers located? And can you segment that, those locations so that maybe you could isolate certain traffic to those segments? Ideally, it would be great if you could segment all your database servers into one uh, network area, maybe your email service, another network area, file and print, etc. So therefore, you can monitor your, your, your database network and database segments, and anything outside of database traffic should trigger an alert. So if you're monitoring your database segment and you see email traffic uh, or hitting your servers or web traffic trying to hit your servers, well, that maybe should indicate that there's something uh, amiss and should need, needs to be investigated uh, as well. Now, it, it can be difficult to do this, I acknowledge, particularly with networks that have been uh, set up and maybe have evolved over time. But at the very least, do try and identify where your key assets are, where the key information is, and then monitor the traffic to those areas and keep it keep keep, uh, keep a close eye on it uh, for any unusual patterns or changes. Another one to do is to harden your systems. So, have you looked at the various different servers and sort of figured out well, how do I make this system more secure? How do I uh, make sure that it can't be hacked into. And traditionally, when we look at hardening systems, we do tend to just look at servers we put out in our DMZ or out on the internet zones. Uh, it's, it's generally recognized to be good practice to do it that way. But what about your key servers inside your organization? Because, you know, again, in the int introduction, we talked about how our perimeters are dissolving and changing. So, you know, once an attacker is inside our network, well, then anything inside that network could be quite easy to attack. It's, it's often referred to as M&M security, nice and crunchy on the outside, but soft in the middle. So is your network soft in the middle? If it is, look at your key service that you identified in the previous slide and figure out, well, let's harden those systems and make them more secure. And, you know, be that a Microsoft or Unix or whatever platforms you're using, there are good resources out there and guides on how to harden those systems to disable services you don't need, to make sure they're patched regularly, to uh, maybe isolate network traffic to them based on IP address or MAC addresses. There's quite a lot you can do to, to, to secure and harden those devices. I know we talked earlier on about the, the amount of data that, that, that we, 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 we have come through, but it's, it's still, it still surprises me sometimes when I go in uh, investigate instance to discover that people don't even have the log files turned on. So have you got the log files turned on on the key systems and applications that you're trying to monitor? And if you have, what is it you're, 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 you're capturing? Have you sat down and thought about what, what events or what type of instance do I want to, to, to be worried about? And then just record those to the logs. So we can strip away a lot of the uh, information that we potentially don't want or don't need or, 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 or to analyze and just identify the key events that we want and monitor them quite uh, uh, aggressively as we, as, as we can. 
And then use the security tools that we have. So what about the security event instant uh, management systems? Are we are this configured and set up properly? Are our RDS systems set up properly? If they're not, well then let's look at ways of, of, of making sure we are utilizing those those tools and those those systems properly. Uh, let's make sure we have the uh, skills in-house or we do get them externally to, to set those systems up the way we want them and that we can use them properly. There's no point having these tools in place provide nice, bright, shiny lights blinking in the computer room if they're not being utilized properly. So review those tools and make sure they're configured correctly and they're getting the information to you in the right way. A key area as well is train staff and partners, and particularly your staff. Your staff can be a very good early warning indicator of something is not right with, the, with, with your systems or with the network. They may notice strange traffic patterns. They may know something strange happening on their, scene, uh, on their screens. Uh, now, some of this, yes, could be just ordinary uh, issues relating to the network or systems, but they could also be in, in, indicative of a potential breach and that uh, uh, somebody has compromised the systems and the network and systems aren't performing as they should as a result of that. So train the staff to, uh, to notice when things are strange or to report instance more so as well. So do your staff report to your support desk when they receive a strange phishing email? Uh, you know, if you go back to the RSA example, that was a spear phishing attack. That was a, a, a phishing email targeted at certain users with the, designed to get their attention. Are your staff trained to identify phishing emails? And if they are, are they also trained to report that to, to, to the security team or the support desk? And on top of that, are the security team and support desk trained properly to deal with the incident and, and, and take the information and investigate it properly as well? So training staff how to identify those things early on can be a, a good uh, a tool in your arsenal as well. I'd also recommend using open source data, particularly when trying to monitor uh, potential attacks against you by hacktivist organizations. Uh, the modus operandi for a lot of these organizations uh, or groups is to uh, promote their attack on various different platforms, be that Twitter or Facebook, and they will uh, rally people to their cause. If you're monitoring those social media, net uh, social media networks for mentions of your organization's name uh, or may maybe using keywords related to a product or an event that you're sponsoring or, or whatever, well, that could... Uh, help you identify that you may be soon under attack or having a problem. Often when, when breaches happen, there are uh, data sharing sites such as Pastebin, which is, 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 has been designed for people to share information. You just cut and paste information from your computer, put it into Pastebin, and you can share that with anybody else. But been, Pastebin has been used a lot by attackers to uh, uh, dump the information they've compromised into Pastebin and then to, to to promote that amongst uh, media or their followers to, to show what their attack has been successful. If you're monitoring Pastebin regularly, maybe using Google Alerts, or there are uh, scripts, etc., that are out there to allow you to do that automatically, you potentially could identify that you've been a victim of a breach, and then you can uh, uh, react straight away. So you could do things like looking for through Pastebin for your company name, maybe for code names for projects uh, or products, uh, maybe names of, of um, key employees, etc. cetera, that, that could be there. And then there are other open source tools uh, that are quite useful. There is the uh, uh, D-Shield organization represented there by the uh, logo of the, the, the green box and the red box. And D-Shield takes a whole lot of inf open source information from various different logs around the world and identify uh, potentially where systems have been compromised or where they've been attacked. And by using that information, it's quite, you can, you can get, again, be alerted to a potential attack. Uh, Arrakis is the, provided by the uh, poll research and it's similar to identifying, uh, potential botnet clients on, on the, on the internet. You know, if you're monitoring that for IP addresses belonging to your organization, it could identify that you've, you, you've got machines, uh, compromised with uh, Trojan or, or computer viruses. And then the Google Safe Browsing Alerts for Network Administrators is an, a tool provided by Google to highlight uh, websites that are hosting malware. And again, if, 
if, if you are monitoring the, the, the safe browsing alerts for URLs specific to your organization, it could give you an alert that your websites have been compromised, and again, you can react quickly to, 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 to the problem. Another uh, trick we've used in, 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 in some environments is the use of honey, honey pots and honey traps within the network. Uh, so honey pots are systems that are set up and designed to look and act like real life systems, but in effect are, 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 are tools used by security professionals to uh, uh, identify potential attacks. So because the system looks like a real system, but you're not promoting it or, or broadcasting it live as a, as, as a system, any traffic or any suspicious behavior on that system would indicate that, and it could indicate that, that you're uh, under attack and uh, would be a good tool to use to, to highlight potential problems uh, and potential attacks in your environment. And then sharing with peers, I think that's one of the things we, we do fail uh, a lot on as security uh, professionals, is we don't share information or data with our peers. So if we're working in a particular industry, if I know that a peer organization has suffered a particular type of attack or been targeted by that type of attack, well, then maybe I can take similar steps to protect my organization. And sharing that information can be quite useful. And it's one of the big advantages of using the uh, Verizon uh, Verus uh, framework, which is which is what feeds the data into the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. It is actually available for free, and uh, you can put your information into it anonymously, but it actually feeds back into the report so we can so it can identify trends that are happening in the industry and what type of attacks are going on, which can only help us all to improve our own security. So using peer-to-peer -peer networks, and that can be something simple like going to uh, your local ISSA meetings or ISACA meetings or uh, OWASP meetings, getting to know peers in other organizations, creating trust with those people, and then uh, sharing war stories or, or information that you can use then to protect your, your environment. Or they may be able to give you a heads up and give you an alert that, that something uh, could be, uh, you know, certain type of attacks could be coming your way. Likewise, using uh, your local computer emergency response teams, they can provide you with a great source of information as well on potential attacks. So there Quite briefly, and I know we've only had uh, half an hour or so to, to, to run through those 10 steps, uh, but they would be 10 steps I would recommend that we can put in place to help us uh, detect incidents much quicker and earlier on uh, and, and hopefully allow us to react better to the, uh, to the issues. So uh, there, there's more information available uh, we, we've, we've published a white paper on the same topic, and it goes into the information that we just went through there on the, on the slides in, a, in more detail uh, and provides more information on it. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, and if there's any questions, Maureen, I'd be quite happy to take them. Fab, thank you very much, Brian. Um, we've got a couple of questions. So the first one that's come through is, what is an CSRS attack, how is it different from the XSS cross-site scripting? Okay, that's uh, uh, what I would recommend people should do is go to the OWASP.org website because it provides a lot of good information there on the different types of web application attacks that are out there. Uh, so, uh, you know, it would provide a lot of good information there on not just on uh, CRS attacks and, and, and cross-site scripting attacks, but also SQL injection and other type of uh, application-based attacks as well. Great, thank you. Um, another one that's come through is, what's the better approach, setting up a firewall, dropping or rejecting unwanted packets? Uh, well, I think you need to sit down and think, well, what is the best for your own particular environment. Uh, dropping packets will mean that uh, potentially attacker will not will, will not see see you see you there. Rejecting it, the attacker could know there's a firewall there. So, but it really would depend on what you want to do in your environment because sometimes monitoring uh, the traffic that you're dropping and rejecting can also give you good information on what, what's going on. 
Okay, thanks. Getting productive solutions to monitor logs in mixed environments um, with high volumes is a task. How can this be addressed? Well, there's lots of different ways we, we, we you can try and do that. Uh, I, I won't go into any product sales pitches here. <laughs> uh, I'll leave that to the to the product experts. But the problem we do have in in the various different uh, log files, etc., is that they do have different formats. They do have different types of uh, error messages. Some of them indeed cannot be, you know, aren't, aren't quite clear. So. What you try and do is try and convert them into a common, uh, uh, a common language, if you like, for a better, better phrase. Maybe doing, using something like syslog or, or whatever the tool you're using can read and try and get all those logs into the same uh, uh, format that they can be read by your t by, by, by your tools and, and uh, can be analyzed properly then. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. We've um, already overrun a little bit, so apologies if we didn't get around to your questions. Um, the slides will be sent out, so um, a copy of the archive website will be sent out to everyone that registered um, today or tomorrow. Um, and if you have any questions, then please, by all means, um, contact your account manager, and he'll be able to help you with any more product information or anything more technical. Um, and please do go to the website, as Brian suggests, and download the white paper on the 10 steps to early incident detection. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Okay. Thank you.